All right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, the NBA script writers, they know what they're doing. They got what they want. Kings-Warriors rematch. Instead of it being the first round of the playoffs, it's the first round of the play-in. And just like last year, Cyrus from Locked On Warriors, Matt George, Locked On Kings, we're going to preview it for you right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome into a special crossover edition of Locked On Kings and Locked On Warriors. My name is Matt George, joined by my guy, the host of the Locked On Warriors podcast, Cyrus. Man, we got to we gotta be enemies again. It's understandable. It's, it's, it's a NorCal rivalry, although for some reason, some people still don't think it is. Maybe you don't think it is. I do. I, I do. It to I be do. at this point in time. And we're frenemies. We're frenemies, Matt. I, I, enemies is a strong word, but we'll, I, we'll I, I see. Digress. <laughs> maybe maybe after Tuesday we'll we'll see how it all goes all but right. the NorCal Brotherhood Big Brother Warriors Little Brother uh, Kings as so many like to to label it out but once again the Kings are in the position of a home court advantage we're going to be breaking it all down talking about the Kings perspective the Warriors perspective on on what's different from the 2023 playoff series between these two teams, what is new? So much great stuff coming for you here on this crossover edition of the Locked On Kings and Locked On Warriors podcast. This is what's, what's so great about the Locked On Podcast Network is that we can do episodes like this. And today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Now, Cyrus and I both have competitive sides and those competitive sides are a big fan of Monopoly Go. It's the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or on Google Play. All right, let's jump into this, Cyrus. Let's talk about this uh, this preview. Really, let's talk about how we got here first and foremost. Right. Very different position from where we were at last season. Both teams dedicated, guaranteed playoff teams last year, the Kings, with only two more wins than they had this year, but that was enough for a third seed, and here they are in ninth, which I consider to be a disaster of a position compared to seventh or eighth, where which is a much easier journey into the playoffs than nine or ten. But here we are, Cyrus. How did the Golden State Warriors get here, the tenth and final play-in spot? Do you think they deserve to be here? Should they, should they have been higher or maybe should they have been a, a little more afraid of the Rockets? <laughs> it's it's been a, 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 a for the Warriors. This has been a borderline existential crisis kind of year for them, simply because uh, from last year to this year, it's night and day different. Man, last year the Golden State Warriors were the defending world champions. Last year the Golden State Warriors, their core were still considered at the peak of their powers. Um, anyone who's watched the Warriors this year knows that the core has at least most uh, some of them, uh, and more specifically, maybe uh, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, um, Draymond Green. For, with Draymond, it's all about whether or not he's going to show up and play and not get ejected or suspended. Um, but it, there's some of these players are not who they were. And so for for Warriors fans and for Dub Nation, I think expectations are very different a year later. Um, versus last year, a at least from my perspective, when you're when you're the reigning world champions, there's a lot of pressure uh, to repeat. There's a lot of pressure on you, given the expectations of what you've just accomplished. Whereas this year, um, you're this this franchise is, I mean, like Stephen Curry, I think said it best. This team has struggled to find an identity all season long, and I think when you look at the Kings and Warriors, they have two very different issues. But so that's my initial perspective, and. Um, you know, so in a lot of ways, at least for, for me, I think the Warriors got what they deserved, given how horrible they started the season. But when you look at the Warriors the second half of the year, I think since since uh, the All-Star break, they have the second most wins in the NBA uh, besides the Celtics. If, I, if that stat is still correct, at least it was like a week ago. Um, so, you know, they're rolling, but it's 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 just the whole season's weird, man. How are you guys doing? Yeah, I feel like this year was a reality check in two very different ways for these franchises. A reality check for the Warriors that, I mean, if the dynasty isn't over yet, it's it's basically on its last legs. And for the Sacramento <laughs> Kings, it's, hey, you're not guaranteed growth just because you had one good year mm -hmm. and, you, and you decided to run it back. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody is expecting either of these teams to actually make it out of the play-in. I've already seen a lot of predictions of it's going to be Pelicans and Lakers in some order of, of seven or eight. To be honest with you, congratulations to the Oklahoma City Thunder, too, with the fantastic year that they had. But out of all the teams that you could face as the number one seed uh, going against number eight seed, I think OKC is actually one of the more 
ideal scenarios or ideal teams. No disrespect to them. They're kind of a young, unproven team, and, and both the Warriors and Kings might be looking to, hey, if we get there, we actually think we can make a little bit of noise against them. Doesn't mean necessarily a one series, but you got to win two games to get there without losing. And that's what sucks about the position that both of these teams are in is, yep. unfortunately, you, like, I know the Warriors have dropped some games this season where it's like, what the hell are they doing? The Kings have lost to Charlotte, to Detroit, to Washington, to Portland this season. Those are four games that had they won, they're in the six seed right now and not even worried about these these playing games so it's been a learning experience in different ways I think for both teams however the the, the big difference that I still see between them Cyrus and this could be an arrogance from the Kings perspective could be cocky whatever you want to call it I still think the Kings are trending in the upwards direction of their building towards something and the Warriors are hanging on to something that is almost over or maybe should be over Depends on the perspective. I think I think uh, what you said uh, echoes a lot of Steve Kerr sentiments. I, he's having a hard time letting go of this core. Um, you know, the, it, again, some perspectives, like like my perspective, for example, is for this season. I don't know if they have enough to win the whole thing. I, I it's highly doubtful. I just can't see them winning four straight series to win a championship. But they have some tremendous young pieces that I think if they had been relying on sooner. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Kaminga is the obvious one. I mean, he's a most improved player candidate, but you have a player like Trace Jackson Davis, um, who only started really playing consistently the last two months. Imagine how the Warriors would have been if he'd been playing the whole year. I mean, that's that's uh, something I, I was advocating for endlessly. You have a player like Brandon Pajemski, um, who has just come out of, I mean, he has been one of the, the most pleasant surprises for the Golden State Warriors. I, when you Look at the Warriors last year with Ty Jerome, who was like a thorn in my side. And then you look at Brandon Pajemski. It's like a night and day uh, comparison between these two. Pajemski is almost everything you want out of a, a point guard, combo guard, whatever you call him. And then and the Moses Moody is still like one of those players where I wish he was consistent. I don't think we're going to see him at all in this series or in this game. I'm sorry, I'm calling it a series. It's one game, which is insane in and of itself. So it just it just depends on your perspective. Like I, To me, the, the Warriors' future is incredibly bright. I feel like the present would still be incredibly bright if Kerr would have moved on quicker instead of uh, you know just holding on to these veterans, thinking that they still have some juice left in their in their tank. Um, so, but you know, so it's just it's just like it's just been one of those years. I, it's hard to nail down anything with this Warriors team, but I'm a little more optimistic than you, or or maybe not you, but maybe than some others in the sense that there are young pieces that really excite me. Um, but, but the but the, the veteran decline has been a disappointment. There's no doubt about that. And I'm very curious to see how this offseason goes. That is a fascination on my part. But um, yeah, man, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the Kings are facing a very different team than they did a year ago. Uh, I'm fascinated by the, how this matchup is going to go. Because as everyone knows, what, three of the four games they played against each other were de decided by one point? Do I yep. have that right? Yep. That's incredible. That's absolutely insane. These two and, teams mir almost mirror each other. And three of the four games were played, I think, before December, which Correct. is also crazy, too. So these two teams, I think, are in very different situations than where they were when they met during the regular season, which I think is going to kind of show an ace up the sleeve on, on both sides. But from the Kings perspective too, like I'm going to address, uh, I'm, I'm assuming he's a, a Dubs fan and here a locked on uh, warriors listener. G Martinez brought up a couple of things that I'm glad he brought up because I want to address it. Cause I think it's a common mindset um, of, of warrior fans. The first one is right there. No monk. The Queens are in trouble. There do, you is, want to, do you want to tease that for when we come back? Yes. I'm sure people would love to hear your thoughts on that. We're going to dive into that. We're also going to dive into Sacramento's defense because that is very, very different from what the Warriors have seen this year and even going back to last year's playoffs. So we'll dive into that. Plus, we'll talk about what's different from the Warriors' perspective and more still to come here on this crossover edition of Locked on Kings, Locked on Warriors, previewing the play-in. This episode of the Locked on Kings and Locked on Warriors podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Cyrus, one of the things I, I really appreciate about modern sports, modern sports medicine, especially in the NBA, is how serious that they take mental health. I am mm -hmm. someone who is an advocate for, for speaking about mental health, an adv Same. advocate for therapy. I've been seeing a therapist for about three or four years since, uh, since going to COVID, and I was the type of person 
that I didn't think that my problems were big enough for therapy, right? I, I thought, oh, I have to have something extreme, some kind of trauma, some kind of loss or something like that for therapy to be for me. My little, the other little things that I'm dealing with, it's it's whatever, it's not that serious. But that's not the case at all. We all carry a baggage, right? We all are struggling with things and talking to a professional, an unbiased professional who, who knows how to help you through these situations and walk with you, not tell you what to do, but just walk with you through these situations. It can make all of the difference. And if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, look, most of us have bigger problems than just our teams driving us crazy with how they're performing <laughs> in the play playoffs of the plan. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try, Check out BetterHelp. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. That's a big deal because it's hard for us to find an hour sometimes to, to go and talk to somebody. It's entirely online. And one of the coolest parts about BetterHelp, establishing a connection with your therapist is important, right? You have to have a trust and a bond there. Sometimes you don't get that on the first or second try. BetterHelp will allow you to change therapists without charging you uh, or anything like that. They really, truly want to get you the help and the therapist that you need. So go to BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. Oh, I should get that overlay out. And thank you for making Locked On Warriors and Locked On Kings your first listen. It's Locked On's NBA Mock Draft. Live on April 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern for Pacific, streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th, again, 7 p.m. Eastern for Pacific to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts and even the fantasy football angle, the Locked On NFL Mock Draft on April 17th at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific, streaming live on Locked On Sports Today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. You can follow Matt George on Twitter at MattGeorgeSAC. You can follow me, Sarah Sotsas, on threads at Dog Wild. Matt, uh, again, this game, we're a day away. I'm super pumped for it. Uh, but you were going to talk about uh, something that I'm very curious about as well, the Malik Monk topic, because yep. he is a Warriors killer. Um, I have no doubt in my mind your franchise is going to do everything they can to resign him, given his value. The dude is a baller. And I'll tell you this, man, I try to be objective when I cover the Warriors. But when I see that Malik Monk is not going to play, I'm not going to lie, dude. The fan is coming out of me. I'm ecstatic. I'm elated. I think that's a huge advantage for the Warriors. Your reaction, sir. Absolutely. Malik Monk doesn't get hurt. The Kings aren't in this position to begin with. And it couldn't mm. come at a, at a worse time because unfortunately Sacramento ran through a gauntlet of some of the top teams in both the Eastern and Western Conference here down the stretch after Malik Monk got hurt by Luka Doncic flopping and falling on him. So unfortunately, uh, the Kings are in a tough spot. They didn't just lose the sixth man of the year. They lost their third best player. They also lost their second go-to scorer and creator. So it's it's going to be something that's tough for this team to overcome. I'll be honest with you. If I'm a Warriors fan, seeing that Malik Monk isn't playing, I would have all the confidence in the world. So I have yep. no, I, I don't, I truly don't have, I have issue with anybody celebrating Monk's injury. And, and I know that's not what you guys are doing. That's not what I'm, no, no, absolutely. I, I don't want, I, this is not what I want. I right. to make it clear. Yeah. But strategically not having to face Monk, it's a big, big benefit for the Golden State Warriors. But you pair that with the other comment from G Martinez, which is talking about Sacks defense. And he has the, right. the, the poop emoji on there. This, <laughs> this is where the biggest difference is with the Sacramento Kings that the Warriors have not seen yet. The Kings have figured something out defensively to where, Ooh. I mean, even the Warriors too, both the Kings and the Warriors are top 10 in defensive rating since the all-star break. So both these teams have figured things out defensively. I would argue that's a bigger thing for Sacramento than it is Golden State because Golden State has always had kind of this identity of defense and guys like Draymond Green and defense was the backbone of a lot of the championships that you guys won, right? So I think defense was more of an expectation for the Warriors than it was the Sacramento Kings. Now, the Kings are still heavily reliant on offense and truth be told, Cyrus, it's it's been concerning for me at times because the Kings defense has almost been more reliable than the offense at times, which mm -hmm. the offense is supposed to be the primary strength. And you think back to the playoffs last year, neither team for some reason could hit a freaking shot. 
like that was more of a defensive series than an offensive series. So if this game goes the same way without Malik Monk, I think the Sacramento Kings have cause for concern. That being said, Sacramento is playing a much more physical brand of basketball. The difference that they're going to throw at the Warriors that the Warriors haven't seen yet are Mike Brown's new three-guard lineups. Well, he'll feature Davion Mitchell, Keon Ellis, who is a name that probably Dubs fans are not familiar with. You will be familiar with him by the end of this game. He's a two-way player that turned into a full contract player. Excellent on the defensive end. Shooting lights out from three-point range right now. He will probably, in my opinion, get a large bulk of the assignment of guarding Steph Curry. Not that you can stop Steph, just make life as difficult as possible for him. Right. I think Dion can do that. So the Kings are much more dialed in on the defensive end. They're playing a much more physical brand of basketball that I do think will be disruptive for mm -hmm. Golden State and something that Warrior fans and the Warriors themselves haven't faced yet. You know, I, I, one one question I'm curious uh, about, which I'm really stoked we're here together so you can answer, is last year, <clears throat> excuse me, an interesting wrinkle that Mike Brown threw in the series was a lot of minutes from Alex Len. And he was trying to take advantage of the fact that the Warriors, yet again, are the smallest team in the NBA. Their average height is 6'5". And I, I thought that strategy was very effective. I didn't think Kirk countered it uh, fast enough. Um, I, I, I never thought he adjusted properly to it. Um, I think it's part of the reason why the series went seven games. Um, do you expect something similar from the Kings? Uh, you know, I have not been following your team close enough uh, this year, obviously, uh, given, you know, I, I cover the Warriors. But what are is do you what do you sense this year? Like, is Mike Brown going to do something like that again? Uh, is JaVale McGee going to get minutes? Um, what kind of wrinkles are you expecting from Mike Brown this year? So Warrior fans and yourself, Cyrus, go back to the box score of the Kings, I think it was 103 to 102, one point loss they had to the Phoenix Suns a couple of nights ago. Look at that box score. I think that's going to tell you exactly what this the rotation is going to be from this game. It's an eight-man rotation. Four out of the five Kings starters played 41 or more minutes. Davion Mitchell played 20 minutes off the bench in kind of the Malik Monk-esque role, although nobody can replicate what Malik Monk does. Uh, and then Alex Len was one of the other two players that played off of the bench. Now, unfortunately, I think the Kings got a grand total of seven points from their bench in that game, so they're going to need Ooh. more. But Ooh. I think Alex Len is going to be one of the eight guys, maximum nine, that Mike Brown plays. Uh, Len will fill the backup center minutes when Demonte Savonis gets a rest or Hopefully he doesn't get into any kind of foul trouble, but I expect Len to play. Trey Lyles will be another guy that Warrior fans have to keep an eye out for. He can get hot from the perimeter. Is also kind of a uh, he's one of the enforcers on this Kings team. He's the guy that typically, if there's a scrap, or if there's some words being thrown, he's involved in that. Not that he's a dirty player or anything like that, but he's just he's one of those enforcers. He's going to kind of bring that energy off the bench while also trying to hit threes and grab rebounds. But this rotation. With Malik Monk out, I expect to be very, very tight. Kings are going to lean very heavily on their starters, which means they need their starters to show up. You can't get a disappearing act from any guy in the Kings. Two of the Kings starters during the playoffs, Kevin Herter, who's unfortunately out for the remainder of the season, and Harrison Barnes, who I know Warrior fans are very familiar with. Yeah. They were basically almost no-shows for the majority of that seven-game series. The Kings cannot have that in this one game playoff. Now the Warriors are going to get a healthy De'Aaron Fox and they saw what he could do to them last year before he oh, got yeah. hurt in the playoffs. Demonte Sabonis is also healthy and I believe is going to be different from what we saw in the playoffs last year. So that's going to be the main thing that Warriors have to be concerned about, slowing those two guys down, which can be either an advantage for the Kings or a disadvantage in a one game playoff. Because in true Kings Warriors fashion, Cyrus, this is why I think this game is terrifying for both teams. It feels like a freaking coin flip. Every time these two teams play, it just feels like a coin flip. So it's 50-50 who's going to win at this point. Do you do you honestly still believe it's a it's a coin flip even with Malik Bunk out? Is that is that is that uh is that irrational confidence or are you are you being uh in your in your from your own perspective, do you feel like you're being logical saying that? Yes, I do, because okay. Malik Monk, uh, the Sacramento Kings beat the Golden State Warriors in Golden State earlier this season in a game where Malik Monk was awful. I think he was like a minus 13 or minus last 20 game. or something. Yeah, yeah, he, was and he had like three points, had an awful shooting night. The Kings were able to be uh, to win that game and, and be victorious in that game. Here's the reason why I think that I'm confident that it is still a coin flip. It's because I think this is going to be a low-scoring game. If it becomes a shootout, it's in favor of Golden State. Because I don't know if the Kings, the Kings have shown an ability to get hot for a quarter or a half and then slow down, especially from the perimeter. The Sacramento Kings offensively will live or die by the three-point shot. And if the three-point shot isn't falling for Sacramento and is falling for Golden State, I don't know how the Kings win that game. 
So that's the area where I give Golden State the edge and I'm realistic. But I don't think, based off of how both these teams have been playing defense and based off of how the playoff series went earlier or, or last year, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're going to get a low 100s score. I think it's going to come down to a handful of possessions, and it might be Steph Curry going for 50 again. It might be De'Aaron Fox having a big game. It might be somebody stepping in out of nowhere. Maybe it's Keegan Murray or Pod or, or Wiggins or whoever the hell it is. There's just so many ways that this game can go, but I don't think it's irrational at all from the Kings' perspective to think that this is a 50-50 coin flip, even without Malik Monk. I would say this. I think if Malik Monk were playing, the Kings would be not heavy favorites because that's absurd. I think the Kings would absolutely be favorites in this game. Without Malik Monk, I think the Warriors should absolutely be the favorites, but not by a lot. Yeah, when we come back, um, we're going to reveal what the FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network, is listing as the line for this game. It is out. Um, and I also have a question for you, Matt, if you don't mind answering when we come back, which is a year ago, um, you were feeling amazing about DeMontis Sabonis. I haven't heard you mention his name once in this show. I just And did. last year, you thought he was going to completely own the Warriors. He had a good series. I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, saying this to disrespect him, but I thought Draymond Green also held his own defending him. It was a contentious series. I mean, and I'm very curious to see how this one game goes, but I'm curious to know what your feedback and your opinion is now, a year later, regarding your star power forward, DeMontis Sabonis. Uh, we'll have that and so much more after we give some love to our sponsors. And our sponsor for this second part of the program is Monopoly Go. And Matt, as you mentioned at the beginning of the program, we are both competitive individuals. Well, we all have competitive sides. My competitive side, Matt's competitive side, is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with our friends. We can charge them rent on their iconic properties, just like the classic game Monopoly. But now you can also rob their vaults of riches for yourself and the leaderboards show who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. It's not just our competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends. You can team up with people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. You got this. Right. I don't care. Yeah, let's let's get back into this. So you so you have a question for me regarding Demontis Sabonis. I'm glad that I get the opportunity to address this because it was it was a bit of humble pie. I think Demontis Sabonis also uh, ate that humble pie a little bit too. But I do have high expectations. I'm also very. I mean, this is a great opportunity to for Sabonis in this game to prove that he has grown. And I expect things are going to be different from both sides. But one thing I expect to be the same is how the Warriors approach defending Sabonis and force him to show that he can he can beat that so I'm, I'm excited to dive into it absolutely um you know so people in the in the chat have asked about Gary Payton the second there is no update right now Matt does a player like him uh concern you at all because the Warriors uh I'm Kerr in the second half of the season particularly I'm glad I've, I've seen this from him is using Gary Payton the second in this role as similar to a, a top level NFL cornerback shadowing an elite wide receiver. He, he's Gary Payton. The second is playing that role. We're off the time. So he'll pick out the opposing team's best offensive player. If they're not a big and we'll just follow him. And, and that's his assignment. Um, does that worry you? Is GPT overrated in your opinion? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think he's, o I don't think he's overrated at all. I think, I think GP two was the best defender of De'Aaron Fox during the playoffs last year. That being said, it's not at the same level of Steph Curry because I'm realistic. I'm not comparing Fox to Curry and saying they're on the same tier because they're absolutely not. And I'm, I'm aware of that. But Fox is also one of those guys where your job is not to stop him. Your job is just to slow him down and make him work as hard as possible. Don't let him get right. to his spots. If, uh, Fox has really added the three point game to his or three point shot to his game this year. So he's not afraid to let him fly from three point range, which makes him a three level scorer, which makes him incredibly dangerous. Um, but Fox is someone who can sometimes shoot himself out of ball games and he hasn't necessarily had the greatest of shooting percentages and his clutch scoring is down this year from when he won clutch player of the year last year. And, and I think GP two is one of those guys that can frustrate De'Aaron and maybe frustrate De'Aaron along the lines of 
playing physical and De'Aaron not getting the whistle that he deserves to get, that he continues not to get uh, from, from NBA officials this year. Uh, but that's a that's a different conversation for a different time in a way that that De'Aaron Fox can kind of get taken out of the game a little bit. But I think if GP2 doesn't play, the Warriors lost their best chance of of making De'Aaron work or slowing him down because they're sure as hell not going to put Steph Curry on him. They never did. Uh, and maybe they'll throw Wiggins at him. Maybe they'll throw Clay or different looks. But I, I, I like I'm confident in in De'Aaron's ability against everybody, including GP2. But if there's anybody that I'm like, OK, that's the guy that's going to make Fox work the hardest. It's Gary Payton the second. What is a uh, what does Matt Yaddick mean in this in the chat? He wrote Beal fouled Fox. Will you elaborate on that? So in the end of the Kings <laughs> Suns game, uh, the the one that they lost by one point, the Kings blew a sixteen point lead. Unfortunately, in that game, which has been very common, that's a thing to note as well. If the Kings get off to a great start in this game, Warrior fans do not panic because Sacramento, especially at home this season, has been notorious for allowing teams back into games. So if the Kings get off to a hot start. It means good. I mean, it's good for the energy. It's good for the game. It's good for Kings fans. But I promise you that nobody in that Golden One Center will feel comfortable. So just just know that and understand that context. That's been a big issue for the Kings this year. Anyway, final play <laughs> of the game. Uh, the Kings are down by one. De'Aaron Fox is looking for a shot. And he turned the ball over and it resulted in a, like a Royce O'Neal dunk, which didn't matter. The the Suns dribbled out the, the clock and that was it. But Fox took the podium right after the game and said, like, I was fouled. Like, Beal hit me on the arm. Now, I have my angle from ABC 10, and, and the last two-minute report came out and said that he was not fouled, that Beal got ball first, then arm. I don't, like, uh, to me, there are other mistakes that the Kings made in that game that warrant blame more than the officiating necessarily. But I, I do think, Cyrus, there is an expectation that if the officials play a, a part in this game, that it's not going to be in favor of Sacramento. What I'm hoping for is, is a game where if we're talking about the officials, it's how we didn't really hear much from them. I want to see Kings and Warriors, mano a mano, go at each other. If it's shot making, if it's physicality, as long as no one's stomping on somebody's chest, we, we will <laughs> we can, that's the line we'll draw. As long as we're I not doing that. About, I forgot about that, man, until just now. <laughs> Let, I forgot all about Sacramento. that, man. Oh Sacramento my God. I've not forgotten about that. I oh, I'm sure. I'm so, sure. Oh as long God. as we're not going to that level, I just want to see two teams fighting, may the best team win on this particular day and let the officials not play a part in it. If we have a low, for, I just hope it's consistent on both sides, right? If the Kings get 15 free throws, the Warriors, and I know it never works out that way, but I don't want to see the Kings with a massive free throw advantage, nor do I want to see the Warriors with a massive free throw advantage. Call it straight up the middle. Let these two teams play it out. They're so similar in so many ways. And who Whoever's the better team on the day, that's the team that deserves to move on. That's what Absolutely. I'm hoping for. I, I, we're, I think we're on the exact same page there. Consistency, fairness. Who doesn't want those things, right? And I, and I hope for the same thing as well. Um, you know, a Willie Bowen, the chat's on fire today, and I love it. Willie Bowen, uh, interesting suggestion here. because And, and I raise this point, not just to, to uh, get your insights, but also it, I'm curious to know, Mike Brown knows this Warriors team better than any other coach yep. in the NBA. I, I, again, I brought this up earlier in the show, the wrinkle last year of, of him going big and, and playing Alex Land, I thought, more than expected. Um, Willie Bowen writes, Mike Brown should start Sabonis at center. Trey Lyles at power forward. Keegan Murray at small forward. Malik, oh, Malik Muck's not playing, so this I didn't see that part of it. Sorry. But the point is, do you like the idea of, of Sabonis being your center? And what do you expect any, any, what do you expect from Mike Brown, given that he knows the Warriors better than anyone else? Well, it's not an idea. DeMontis Sabonis has been the center for the Sacramento Kings all season. Sabonis is, is a center. Like, he's an undersized center, but he is a center. Like, the Kings have played him as a center with a two-wing lineup of, of Murray and Harrison. You can it, it, you can say Murray's playing the four and Harrison's playing the three. It doesn't matter. Murray def defends typically the better wing to bigger guard, and Harrison doesn't. Um, not to say Harrison's bad defensively, but Murray has made tremendous growth in that area more than Murray. Like Murray has actually taken a slight step back offensively. And I know offensively he had some big games against the Warriors in the playoffs last year, but defensively he's taken a tremendous leap. So I don't know if he's going to have the assignment of Wiggins, who I know Wiggins has had a bad year for y'all, but Wiggins has been a King's killer in the past. So he is someone that still sparks a little bit of, of fear or concern because Sacramento typically has had a tough time handling long athletic wings like Wiggins. That's why the Kings are 0 and freaking 5 against the New Orleans Pelicans this year, who did nothing to help Sacramento against the Lakers. Thank you very much, New Orleans. Ooh, um, yes. But And just to let you know, let the, let the audience know, I, I've been as harsh of a critic of Wiggins as anyone this season. With that said, 
the last two months, he's a whole different player, man. And the Warriors are going to need him and then some. Are you, is your team and your fan base, are you worried about the Warriors youngsters? Do they even register in your minds or are, is your focus just the veterans? Um, I wouldn't say worried. I think we acknowledge the the strength of that. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Moses Moody. I wanted the Kings to go out and get Moses Moody, whether it was in the trade or in the draft. I love Moses Moody. Trace Jackson Javis, Davis is a player that in the draft last year, I wanted the Kings to try and go out and get. So I there's a lot of talent, young talent in Golden State that I admire, that I appreciate, and I wouldn't mind seeing swap a, a Warriors jersey for a Kings jersey in the future. That being said, there's only one man that Sacramento's concerned of. It's Steph Curry. And 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 I don't say that to disrespect the Warriors. I say that to respect Steph. Yeah, how dare we, you? How we, dare you, man? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> we saw last season, and that's like Clay could get hot. He's killed the Kings in the past. Wiggins could get hot. He's killed. So there's a lot of weapons on this roster for the Kings to be concerned about. But Steph Curry dragged the Warriors to that series win last season. He did. And that, that yeah. fair and square, they won. I'm not using that to dismerge the, the Warriors at all. I'm just being honest. Like Steph literally had a meeting with his team before game seven and said, trust me, I will get us there. And then went out and dropped 50 on the Kings. So that is the guy that the Kings are worried about. I, in many ways, I think that Steph is going to have to have another superstar performance like that for the Warriors to get out of Sacramento with a victory. Because I do think the Kings defensively are good enough to, in one game, handle the Warriors supporting cast but what version of Steph Curry shows up mm. if he hits five six threes the Kings can survive that if he goes nine of ten from three-point range and has 30 points in the third quarter Sacramento's probably in trouble so in a, in a broad way to answer your question Cyrus there are a lot this roster on the Warriors side tons of guys that the Kings have to respect and I promise you do respect including Kings fans Steph Curry is the only one we're terrified of and look, the Kings fan, Kings fans last year experienced what Celtics fans two years ago experienced, right? It's just that when when Curry's playing like that, there isn't much you can do. Um, are you before we go to the final predictions? We're running up on the clock here. I'm aware of that, but classic jukebox band uh, writes that the NBA wants the Warriors to advance because Curry draws ratings. I mean, that's a conspiracy theory, but I, uh, there's also some validity due to that. Given this is sports, this is entertainment. Are Kings fans, like, do you have that cynical view of a game like this where you think the NBA is against your team because of Curry star power? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, something happened in 2002 that you might remember that has, yes. has led That's not to cynical. That was a, not cynical for the record. A, yes, go ahead, sorry. A, a permanent <laughs> distrust. There is a permanent distrust for many Sacramento Kings fans of the NBA because of what happened in 2002. We are aware of the market that we are in. And we are aware of the market that the Warriors are. We're especially aware of the market that the Los Angeles Lakers are. So I think there's always going to be a level to that. That being said, personally, you will find me avoiding those conspiracy theories and those topics as much as possible. Now, if like we talked about earlier, if, if the Warriors win this game and they shoot 26 free throws to Sacramento's 10 or 11, I think it's fair to ask questions. But if they're fouls, they're fouls type thing. And, and I do believe like the Kings are good enough to overcome something to an extent. I do not have any expectation in my mind, Cyrus, of the officials coming into Sacramento with the goal to get the Warriors out there with a win. I don't, I don't subscribe to that level of thinking. I think that's too in the weeds of conspiracy theory. If the NBA prefers a matchup in the second round of the plan, it's Warriors in LA versus the Lakers. It's obvious for obvious reasons. That being said, Warriors Kings was one of the most popular and successful first round playoff series in NBA history last year. So I promise you the NBA is very excited to have for one night only a rematch of these two teams again. Absolutely. And look, Tim, Don Tim Don uh, Donaghy is a very real thing. I mean, he's still out there talking about this and I don't blame Kings fans for a second being jaded about 2002. That was that was real, and it's still happening. I mean, look, the Michael Porter's younger brother just is about to go go through hell because he rigged some games recently, allegedly. Um, anyways, uh, we're going to go to predictions now, if, if that's cool with you, Matt. Uh, Ken Mamba, by the way, writes, and I think this is an answer uh, we both are in agreement with. He asks, who do we, who do the uh, Warriors and Kings prefer playing in the second game if either team wins? It's Pelicans, right? Would you agree with that as well? No, no, God, no. No, oh, you prefer the, the Lakers? 100%. The Pelicans beat the Kings five times this year and oh, are in a matchup right. nightmare. That's the right. Kings were 4-0 and against the Lakers this year, and Anthony Davis is DeMontis Sabonis' son. So 
Sabonis has literally never lost in his career against Anthony Davis. So if the Kings can advance past the Warriors and get the Lakers, I actually really like the Kings chances of getting the eighth seed, even if that game is in LA, the Pelicans, they just, for some reason, CJ McCollum never misses a shot and they Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson. They just have, they are the type of team that is built to beat Sacramento. They have a lot of size and athleticism and length on the wing that the Kings just struggle to deal with. So I'm taking Lakers over Pelicans all day of the week, go Pelicans in the first round of the play. And we'll know the result of that Cyrus before our game, uh, Kings and Warriors on Tuesday night, but I'm definitely choosing the Lakers if I have a choice. Interesting. Yeah. We're, we're totally different there. That's fascinating. I, I, I thanks for enlightening uh, myself and everyone else. So our, the official sports book of the locked on podcast network FanDuel and their sports book, they're listing the warriors as two and a half point favorites, the over under two twenty three and a half. your prediction, sir. I think that's fair. I, I do think it's fair that the Warriors are favored in this game. I think they deserve to be based off of the playoffs last year, based off the history, and they're pretty much healthy, and the Kings are not. Uh, predictions, I think it's going to be a close game. I think it's going to be a defensive battle. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game on the scale of Kings-Warriors, right? We're not talking 80 to 90 or anything like that. Or, God, I hope not. That's boring. <laughs> but I think it's going to be a physical game. I think it's going to be scrappy. I think it's going to be fun. I think you're going to have moments of De'Aaron Fox versus Steph Curry battling it out for the shoe brand, <laughs> uh, but having fun one-on-one -on -one against each other. And then to, to kind of go back to the DeMontis Sabonis thing too, I think DeMontis Sabonis is going to change some minds in this game. And I'm not necessarily talking about Warriors fans specifically. I'm talking about the national media because mm. Sabonis has been disrespected all season long for the absolute outstanding numbers that he's been putting up because so many people only watched the Kings versus the Warriors in the playoffs last year and made all their judgments based off of that. I, I have full confidence in DeMontis Sabonis. I'm very interested to see, like I said earlier, He's going to get put to the test the exact same way. Can Has he grown? Can he figure out how to beat it? Will he, he hit the outside shot? He's a decent three-point shooter on a very, very small volume. Can he hit the mid-range shot? He took a couple middies the other day against Portland or last night against Portland. It went really, really well for him. So I want to see the Warriors dare him to beat them the same way. And I want to see him show that he can do it. I think he's going to be capable of doing it. I'm not predicting a Sabonis masterclass where he drops 25 plus points. He can do that. We shouldn't expect that from Sacramento, but I think Sabonis is going to be significantly better than he was if he does that with the Star Fox that I believe, even without uh, Malik Monk. I think the Kings can scrap out like a 107-105 victory, but if it's a high-scoring game, I think it's in the Warriors' pan Warriors' hands, to be honest with you. And uh, no, that's all I want is honesty. And honestly, I just don't think your team's going to overcome the Malik Monk absence. If if Monk is there, the, the Kevin Herter thing, I feel like we could spend a whole other show on that. But the Malik Monk thing, that's it. I just he's so important, man. That's he's he, he's your third best player. You know, it'd be the equivalent. I, I don't know who he'd compare to with the Warriors. It almost I feel like it almost be like if the Warriors lost Draymond, it, it's that level of of importance um so just for that reason alone i think the warriors will win this game but i would not i'm not expecting a blowout either you're in sack too many emotions going on i, I think it's going to be close but um i think the warriors will pull it out matt this was a pleasure brother any any final thoughts you can take it away if you want to finish it up no i hope the beam is lit i hope it's a good atmosphere <laughs> i hope it's fun look the one thing is, regardless of who we're rooting for, we all win because Kings versus Warriors is good basketball and it's fun. It's entertaining basketball. I think the, the reaction around the league for this game speaks volumes, right? People are excited to watch these two teams play. And I think that's one of the best kind of, even with the situation that the Warriors are in, even with the situation that the Kings are in, I think that speaks to the quality of, of these two teams and how evenly matched these two teams are by how excited people are. That being said, Ticket prices reflect that too, Cyrus. I don't know if you've seen this. The <laughs> no, get-in prices for the NBA play-in games. You ready? Lakers at Pelicans, get-in price, $39. Heat at 76ers, get-in price, $50. Hawks at Bulls, get-in price, $58. Warriors at Kings, get-in price, $212. Dollars. People are paying man. to watch this basketball, man. NorCal basketball. It's great that NorCal's on the map. We all agree that NorCal is better than SoCal, and we hope <laughs> they represent it here. And uh, I hope it's a fun game. I hope there's trash talk. I hope it's friendly. Uh, Warriors fans, I've gone back with a lot on social media and here on, on Locked On. I have fun with it. I think y'all are, are, are a ton of fun. Uh, and I, I just hope we get a good basketball game and uh, and, and the beam is lit. Absolutely. Minus the beam lit part. I'm totally with you, Matt. This was a, this was an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you, man. As always go Kings. <laughs> Later, brother.